Hello. How are you guys doing? Look at this shirt all bunched up. <laughs> Good morning to you. You live in a shoe. How are we doing on this fine Monday for you? Sunday for me. I have had an amazing day today. You know, it was interesting. I was thinking about this last night when I was doing my gratitude list. As you know, I've kept a gratitude list, uh, a gratitude book every day since January 1st. With the exception of one day that I missed, and I don't even know how I missed it, but I, I caught it because of the dates. Um, I don't even remember not doing it that night. But I have kept a gratitude list every night before I have gone to bed, and it has really, really helped me. And it's interesting... You know that when I'm reflecting on my, that day, looking back on it, when you break your life down to one day that you've just had, how even like at times that like things happen that aren't, you know, necessarily amazing, that I still have this amazing life. You know, it's like, you know, I can appreciate sometimes like in the trouble that has gone on in my personal life, things that haven't been great, you know, people getting sick and things like that. It teaches me to have more appreciation for those people on a daily basis and to have another day with them and to have another day of living, you know, and it makes me really appreciate life so much more. And um, it's interesting, like I always like, you know, like today things that will be on my gratitude list before I go to bed will be like having a good brunch with my husband. We walked into uh, Patashu today, our favorite place for brunch, and um, our really good friends were there that are a couple and that we've been friends with for, a, like we met them like six months after we started dating. And so we sat down and we had brunch with them and that was really fun. And um, you know, like driving with the windows down because it's been beautiful today taking a nap while Alex watched a movie. He was watching a movie in bed with the dogs and I laid down and took a nap for an hour and that was really nice. And you know, just the small stuff just makes my life so fantastic. And um, like Alex was cooking, he made a salad in the kitchen and he was uh, grilling chicken and um, on the George Foreman grill. And it, like the whole house smelled so good and so I woke up from my nap to like the house smelling really really good and um, it didn't even smell like chicken it just smelled like a restaurant I don't know how to explain it but um, it's just small things like that Alex fixed our back door today he uh, I was out running some errands and he texted me and he goes you're never gonna guess what and I was like what and he was like daddy fixed the back door I was like all right so, um, and like turn the alarm clock off, alarm clock, turn the alarm off first. So everything is like, it's aligned and working. We could not believe it. And, um, so we don't have to have a contractor out and I can now buy patio furniture for my back patio. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Our front walk and our front porch is like all ready for summer. And it was raining this afternoon after brunch or we would have gone and bought patio furniture today. So we're going to start looking this week and next weekend we're going to buy some patio furniture and I'm so excited about it that I'm actually going to have a full patio. Yay. I'm going to buy a bunch of plants out there and flowers and I already have a waterfall out there uh, from like years ago that I had and I might buy another one and I just can't wait to make it so awesome out there. I'm going to get a little gate for, because we have like a step that goes down off of our patio. I think I'm going to get a little gate so the dogs will stay up there and they won't go off the porch. And then like around the bottom of the patio, I'm going to get like those slate tiles and I'm going to put them down so that we have, um, like you step down on the slate. If that makes sense, I'm going to go to Menards um, or Lowe's tomorrow and look and see what they have where I can buy that stuff that's not like not too expensive, you know? And um, so we can have like a little patio off the patio, so to speak. I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited to enjoy the 
that. But you know, Tanya every summer always gets so excited about, she just put up her awning. She has an awning that she puts up over her patio and she strings Christmas tree lights and uh, you know, gets, she was looking at new furniture yesterday and she always gets like a new couch out there. And I'm always like so jealous because our patio has like been falling apart and sucked the last couple years. But last year we got a new patio. If you guys watch my vlog, you know I was so excited because I went and got those tall chairs. And just to have a place that, like, I can sit out there and read and really enjoy it. Like, I'm so excited. And we found patio furniture at Costco. Um, but I don't know. I want to I wanna look around a little bit more and see what we can really find. So, um, I have the money saved for patio furniture. So, I'm just ready to get it and, um, you know, do that up. I'm so excited about it. And, um... I want to look and see at Best Buy how much one of those, I don't even think it's that expensive. I think you can get it and just do it like off your computer now. But one of those things where you like shine the, the, the movie up on the side of the wall and then we can watch movies out there and stuff like that. I think that would be really fun and have popcorn and have our friends over. I think that would be so much fun. I was sitting around tonight and I was like, Alex, uh, he doesn't have to work very much tomorrow and I don't have to work tomorrow or Tuesday. And so, um, he gets done around two-ish tomorrow, two or three. And so we're gonna probably go look at patio furniture after that. But I uh, was thinking like, it was really nice spending the whole day with him and I wanna spend the you know tomorrow afternoon and evening with him too. So I'm gonna get up tomorrow and make my videos right away. And then I was like, a couple years ago, a friend of mine for my birthday, God, it's been a long time now, like five or six years, she bought me all the Alfred Hitchcock movies, a collection. And, um, so Alex and I started watching them, and we watched Rear Window and Birds. No, we watched Rear Window and um, The Man Who Knew Too Much. And I was kind of surprised because I didn't think that Alex would like them because whenever we talk about, like, old movies, like, Alex considers, like, Mean Girls an old movie. And I'm like, no, like, 1940s movies. And I really didn't think that he would enjoy them, but he loved them. He loved the old movies. And so I was thinking how fun it would be to, like, you know, tomorrow night get some snacks and sit around and, you know, watch some Alfred Hitchcock movies and, um, just kind of fall asleep that way. And, um, so I'm going to try to vlog throughout the day tomorrow. Um, so we can watch movies tomorrow night. We'll see how that goes. And, um, <laughs> do you ever like come up with plans in your head, but you haven't run them by your, uh, best friend or your partner or whatever. I mean, I, Alex doesn't know that this is my plan, so I'll have to let him know that this is my plan. I'm sure he'll be like, yeah, sure, whatever. Actually, somebody commented on one of my videos and said, you should watch Ritual on Netflix. And I went and I watched the trailer for it, and it looks so good. It's about like four friends in the outback in Australia that are like taking a trip. And it looks really, really scary. And I had just said to Alex the other night, I was like, um, let's just spend a night and watch some movies. We haven't done that for a while. And he was like, okay, well today he did that while I was making videos and stuff. I kind of took my time making videos today. It was really nice. But anyway, so we were going to watch some scary movies. We're going to pick a night this week to watch some scary movies. And um, that would actually be a good one because it's on Netflix. We don't have to pay for it that way. You all know I'm all about a bargain. And, um, but it was funny because, um, he was like, well, what movies do you want to watch? And then he goes, Iron Man? And I was like, no. He knows I don't love those Marvel comic uh, movies. And he does. Alex is obsessed with all of those, like, Marvel movies and all those superhero movies. And so I was making videos, and I was like, he had all the dogs in bed with him. He was upstairs watching. The, he had, like, watch these, he was watching these movies on the computer, and I was making my videos. But, like, I would make a video, and then I would go outside, and I would sit there, and I, it was so pretty outside today. Um, it like rained for like an hour and then it got beautiful and, um, people were walking by. Our neighbor was working, um, our neighbor's dad was working on her yard out front and clearing it out. So it looks really nice. And, um, so I would like read for a half an hour and then I would like come back inside and make another video, read for a half an hour and Alex is watching. We, it just was such a relaxed day. It was awesome. And, um, just, it was really a really nice day. But anyway, so I was sitting there and I was uploading my videos and I could hear Robert Downey Jr. And I go, are you watching Iron Man? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I told you I wanted to watch that. And he was like, no, you told me you didn't want to watch it. I was totally joking with him. <laughs> anyway. 
So yeah, we'll probably do that. We love to watch scary movies together. It's like one of our favorite things to do. So we're gonna pick a night and do that this week. There's actually a couple Alfred Hitchcock movies that I don't really remember. Like I don't really remember like Sabotage, Strangers on the Train. I love North by Northwest. It's one of my favorites. Um, the oldest ones, like 39 Steps. I don't remember those at all. But I love any kind of film noir. Like, I love any of that, you know? And, um... So, yeah. So... And I have a lot of those movies. Like, Arsenic and Old Lace and the Thin Man series and all of those. I have all of those that we can watch. So... I was thinking about all the stuff that, like, I'm excited about this summer, you know? And... Um, all the stuff that I used to do, and it's kind of fun thinking back on all of that, and last year I said I wanted to get some of those short pajamas, you know, and I ended up getting a pair of short, like, pajama shorts at Target, and I got them, like, two sizes too big, and I got home, and I, like, even as tight as I could tie them, they were, like, they fell right off of me, <laughs> so, but I really, like, around the house... I mostly wear sweat shorts and t-shirts. I'm sure that doesn't surprise anybody. And, uh, Alex is so funny. Like, as soon as he comes home, like, the first thing that he does if we're not going somewhere is he takes his clothes off and changes into something comfortable like sweats or sweat shorts, like, immediately. We are a big sweat, uh, short family. Are you guys, like, do you buy sweat shorts? We love them. And, um... So, yeah. We meant to uh, finalize our trip this weekend, but Alex has to find out the days, because he has a work conference, so he has to find out the days that he can not have to work and to take vacation so that we can go, because for me, it doesn't really matter. And um, so he's going to check on that tomorrow and call some of his contracts that he has and then he's going to let me know and then we're going to finalize our trip plans and um really really excited I'm really excited or maybe I know this is I said I don't want to go to Mexico but we're maybe thinking Mexico now we talked to our friends today and they just got back from a wedding in Mexico and they were like it was completely safe so I don't know. We might go back to the exact same place we went last year. We had such a great time doing that. Um, I know I would love to go back there. I've been reading so much the last couple days. It's been really nice. I love to read outside. I have to kind of like watch the people walk down the street and then they always say, we, I mean, I joke about our neighbors not being really friendly, but a lot of them are kind of friendly, you know? I mean, just not the ones like right in our immediate vicinity. So it's interesting like when they all walk in, they're like, hey, how are you? I'm like, good, how are you? We get a little, we get along better with most of them now than we did before too, so that's nice. This Friday is my two-year anniversary of being on BookTube. It's crazy to think, like, how different my life is now compared to then, you know? Like, I can remember, like, right now, like, two weeks before, I had started watching BookTube videos. Like, a lot. Well, probably, like, a month before. <coughs> I started really watching booktube videos a lot and really getting into them. And, uh, there were all kinds of, I would just like, I couldn't believe there was this whole community of YouTubers that were talking about books, you know? And then I started my booktube channel just like, you know, on a spur of the moment. And I was so excited about that. And, uh, then that late summer, I started um, my Peter Mon channel. I had done videos on it years ago, but, um, and then I started with a couple videos. I ended up privatizing those videos. The very first video that's on there is a drama video. It's a drama video that I did about Jeffree Star, because that's really kind of what I wanted the focus of that channel to be. Um, and so, 
that was September 1st of 2016. So, and Labor Day will be two years um, on my main channel. And then that following December, or that following December 31st was my very first day vlogging. And then a couple years ago, I started the, my so-called Healthy Life channel. But this December, I started um, it as Peterisms. And I don't know, it's just crazy, you know, when I look back and I think about like, really, I mean, my life is 85% about YouTube now. And I love that, you know? YouTube and writing, I would say, is like 85% of my life. And I love it, you know? I love everything about it. I love coming up with the ideas of what I want to make videos about. And I love, you know, thinking about the videos that I'm going to make and interacting with you guys. It was interesting because I was showing, like, all of my unread email requests on um, my Twitter. It's like, I can't keep up with it. And, um makes me sad because I wish that I could respond to every single person, but at the same time, I was like, I just was show. I need a stream, a stream, a stream, a stream, a stream of like all the direct messages I got, <clears throat> but I wish I could keep up with them all. Um, it's just unrealistic for me to keep up with them all and film four videos a day and, um, You know, it's interesting because I was talking to uh, Rich Lux today, who's a friend of mine, and we were just talking about YouTube and that we really struggle with understanding, like, YouTubers that complain about making YouTube. And he said to me, he goes, you have to, he goes, Peter, honestly, he goes, you have to be, like, the hardest working YouTuber I've ever met. And I go, no, not really. And he goes, you love making videos. He goes, that's all, he goes, you're like, that's, like, you spend so much time making, I go, yeah, but I got it down to a science where it, like, only takes me, like, two and a half, three hours to do, two hours yesterday, I timed it, and, um, he's like, but you put four videos out every day on four different channels, he is somebody, too, that is so passionate about it, it's nice to have somebody to talk to, you know, that just loves doing what you do so much, and I love, uh, this shirt is driving me nuts, if you can't tell. I don't know, I just love all of it, I love being able to talk to you guys and seeing the comments that you leave me, and it's so funny, like, on here, the small things that you notice, or you'll say, like, I just noticed that somebody said, I, I live in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I sleep with a fan, and I was like, oh my god, that is so funny, that that's, like, the piece they pulled out of my, like, video that I talked about with my aunt and uncle going to stay on their farm in the summer, you know, so, like, it makes me so happy to share, like, stories of my life and things I've gone through on here, because other people relate to it, and I think that's cool, you know, and it's not like my stories are like, well... You know, this time that I uh, <laughs> met this movie star at a party in Paris. I mean, like, my stories aren't like that, you know? My stories are uh, going to Bob Evans and, you know, hanging out with my best friend, driving around. And I've always wanted to be on YouTube. I've always wanted to find on YouTube people that were relatable to me, which is why, like, I love Raw Beauty Christie. She's very relatable to me. Like, I can imagine she and I just hanging out. Brittany and Baby, I love her so much. Oh, my God, I love her, the mommy blogger. But, like, she reminds me of so many of my friends that, like, I go over to their house, I'm just standing there in the kitchen, and they're packing lunches, you know? And there's something very, very comforting to me about that. So, when I find that in other people like attracted to watch those videos and I think like that's what I aim to want to be you know on my own channel is like be myself be relatable and those people that really really like me are going to want to watch it and um, I just love you guys that continue to comment over and over and over again saying you know nice things and um that the things that you relate to or oh my god you know my grandmother this or my mom that like I love I love reading the little stories in the comments that you guys leave um, it just, it means the world to me. It honestly does. And, um, if I could sit down and respond to every tweet, I try to really keep up with the tweets. The direct messages are hard. If I could, you know, because I don't want to just give one, like a one line response or a blue heart. You know, I was doing that on Snapchat for a while. And it just like, I think when people were leaving me really long messages and then I would just respond with a blue heart, it almost was kind of like, well, why even, you know, respond at all? I don't know if that makes sense. But, I mean, 
mean, I want people to know that I see it, if that's, if that makes sense. Maybe one of these days it'll all slow down for me, you know, and then I'll have time. But right now I'm writing so much that, um, I'm really excited about my book that I'm working on that. <laughs> my book, my book, my book. I'm really excited about, uh, the stories of my life that I'm working on telling that. And, um, that's what I've been like really focusing on lately. And it's been kind of nice to take a break from fiction writing, honestly, you know, and just focus on that. And, um... It's really kind of falling together nicely. It's interesting. Um, and it's also interesting me looking at my life from an evaluative point of view and seeing the stories that happened and even in ways that I, I already wasn't aware of that there is definitely a theme in my life. And um, this, obviously, I'm not going to ruin the book for you, but just to give you a hint, the, the book starts off... Um, with me in the hospital room the day that my mom passes away. That's the intro story. And then it goes back in time. And, um, because I wanted to give some kind of, like, framework to why I was telling the story. And, um, you know, it's interesting when you go back and you look at your life and you write it out on paper. It's very much like doing inventory in a 12-step program, you know? When you do inventory over everything that's happened to you in your life, it's hard for the themes to not stand out at you, you know? And you go, oh, wow, like, maybe this is an issue, you know? Maybe I have felt this way the majority of my life, and this is why I respond to things this way, you know? And um, writing this book has been so cathartic for me because what it's done is it's made me realize kind of why I am who I am today. Um, you know, it's made me... I mean, this is a book about my childhood. And so when I go back and I'm writing stories, you know, and let's say if it's a story about how... You know, I was sitting at a cafeteria table. You guys have heard this story, so I can tell it. You know, and like all of a sudden I'm isolated from my peer group. But then the next story is about, like, my two girlfriends growing up, Katie and Jesse, and how we would, like, sit on those electrical boxes while all the kid, all the boys played, you know, baseball in the cul-de-sac, and we would, like, pop our gum, and we just kind of walked around, and we thought we were, you know, we thought we were the answer and stuff, and I thought I was so cool, and that is inclusivity, and those have been, you know, two things that I've struggled with my entire life, you know, inclusivity and exclusivity, being part of something and not being part of something. Thing. And I think it has a lot to do with my social anxiety. And almost every story that I tell in my book, there's a, there's an aspect of that, of me feeling part of something or not feeling part of something. And, uh, you know, I think that's a lot of times where validation comes from and the need for acceptance and validation. So I think for me, like, it's really interesting to look at these things and also see that, you know, like, wow, how far I've come, you know, like... I'm not the person that I used to be. Like, I don't handle situations the same way that I used to. And what things have brought me to the point where I don't handle situations the way that I used to, you know? Anyway, I just think it's interesting that... It would be interesting for anybody to do. You guys could do it, too. You could write down major events that have happened to you in your life. And, you know, looked at... How did you respond? Really do some inventory on it and look at how you responded to it. What part of you did it affect? I mean, that's the inventory part of it, you know, and what your part of it was. And that's totally the inventory right there. But when you're writing it out in story form, even if you just are journaling it, it's hard that certain things don't just like pop out. And like one thing for me that was pretty consistent of my childhood is that whether I was afraid, whether I was scared, whether I was angry, no matter what my emotion was, I was very quiet about it. Like, I didn't... Oh, the yellow light just came on. I was very quiet about it. Like, I didn't really ever speak up about how I felt. And so, to some degree... And it wasn't like my parents wouldn't have listened to me because they would have. I had very loving parents, you know? But to some degree, I think I was afraid to cause waves... I learned that at a very young age, you know? I don't know why. Um, I haven't discovered that yet in my stories. And I don't know that we ever really know all the answers. But, you know, I think it's interesting that I, I stay quiet. Well, I know that when I go into high school then, that I'm being, like, harshly bullied. 
I stayed silent. You know, and so to some degree, I never fought for myself. And I think it's interesting, you know, this kind of response to the world that I never fought for myself. And I don't really know where I get that from, but honest to God, I almost kind of think like, my mother fought too hard and my dad didn't fight enough. And I think that it kind of sent me me mixed messages, mixed messages, if that makes sense. I just mean in life. Like, my dad doesn't, he's not a battle fighter. He just isn't, right? Like, I mean, he has no problem putting somebody in their place like that quick if he feels like he's in the right. But he doesn't aim to be that person. You know what I mean? My dad's a really, like, decent human being. My mom, on the other hand, I mean, she fought every battle that came her way. She did not pick her battles. And I struggle with that. Like, I really struggle with, like, zip your mouth, you know? And um, so I think, like, I got a lot of mixed messages from two different parents that were doing two different things, if that makes sense. I know this is going to shut off in just a second because of that stupid yellow light. I'm at like 25 minutes and 30 seconds. I'm like, can I make it to 30 minutes without it shutting off? Um, but anyway, you know, like, it's just, I think that it's interesting that I took those cues from my parents on how to respond to the world. And um, I think also, like, one of the things I'm realizing now was that maybe being an only child affected me more than I thought it did. Um, I think in just being lonely and then also being self-protective because I, I knew, and I'm not talking about like at home, I'm talking about like in a school environment. I really didn't have anybody to lean on by my, except for myself, you know? And so, because I always have this attitude with like bullying it, that it's, it's better to not be in the fight or have somebody coming at you than having to defend yourself, if that makes sense. Like, I would rather just avoid it completely than have to confront it and deal with it. I just didn't, I never liked arguing or fighting or any of that. I didn't like any of that stuff. But the reality that's interesting is that I only ever remember my parents ever once having any kind of like real argument. And really it was my mom shouting at my dad and it was the night that he left And I didn't know this at the time. My dad left in January. I didn't know this at the time, but my dad had told my mom in August on his birthday that if things were not better by this date, he was going to leave. And he told me, and so did she, that they both knew that it was done. Like, that was the date that he was going to leave. So, you know, and she was very, she drank a lot that night, and she was very, very upset. And I remember them fighting, and um, I think my dad called my friend Jesse's mom, who was, I don't know how it all went down, but her mom was one of my mom's best friends always in life. Because the doorbell rang, my parents stopped fighting, and Jesse was at the door, and I'll never forget this. And um, it was in January, it was like the middle of January, we were way past Christmas, and Jesse said, can Peter come out and play? It's 10 o'clock at night, okay? I'm in my pajamas, so, you know, they put me in my boots and my coat, and I go outside, And Jesse and I walked up and down the street. This is just like such a weird memory to me. Like, I don't even know why. Like, I mean, I'm getting like, I can feel myself getting emotional inside of it, inside. But like, we held hands and and I said, I remember I was like crying. And Jesse said, let's just sing Christmas carols. And we walked up and down the street singing Christmas carols. Oh, it just stopped. Okay, let's hope it's cooled down a little bit. So, um... But anyway, my friend Jesse came and got me. I mean, and I'm at the time, you know, mind you, six years old, seven years old, six. And um, she said, let's just, and she would have been at the time, like, let's say nine, ten. And she said, let's just walk up and down the street and sing Christmas carols. And I'll never forget, we just walked up and down the street. It was very snowy outside, very cold. And we just walked up and down the street and sang Christmas carols. And never spoke about it again. Never said anything about it again, you know. And... Her family was so wonderful to me, and uh, so my mom and dad were like in my class and, and school and everything, like the first divorced couple that like was going through it. But like Jesse's mom, who was one of my mom's best friends, I mean, through her entire life to the day she died, um, she and like her mom had been divorced and remarried this guy, and they moved into this neighborhood. And a lot of people were like, I mean, you guys, like, it's crazy when I look back on it that, like, divorce was looked down on at that point, you know? Because I remember when they moved in and 
because she was like a decorator and she was real wild and um, you know like they had a boat in the Bahamas and you know just fun people you know and they always had like their Jesse's brother always had like uh, you know hockey goals and then in the driveway and they like they had rollerblades long before anybody else had rollerblades and would play ice hockey with rollerblades in the driveway and stuff and they were just such a good family for us and I can remember like my mom and I would go over there and they would have like fondue and if my mom was like going out with friends for the night like they would be like just come over here you know have Peter come over here and I would go over there and I would sleep over and it's so weird as I'm telling this story you know how like houses have smells I loved the smell of their house and it very much smelled like potpourri like this like certain kind of potpourri and I can like still smell it in my like I can smell it as I'm thinking about it and um but, you know, that was, like, the only fight that I ever saw my parents ever get into was that night. And it really wasn't a fight. It was at the top of the stairs, and my mom was yelling at my dad, like, I can't believe you're doing this. Why are you doing this? And um, she was intoxicated. And my dad just, I remember he had this green army parka on, and he just stood there and at the top of the stairs. And um, maybe I didn't go and sing carols until after my dad left. I think that might be the case. And, uh, but that was really, well, that's not true. Then Christmas, the following year, my dad came and was like part of our family for Christmas for me. And it didn't end pretty. It was like really ugly. And I was like, my dad's nurse at the time had to come pick me up. And my mom like started screaming at my dad halfway through Christmas again, because she was intoxicated, you know? Um, and what was so interesting was like, you know, is my mom... Like, when she got sober, like, she was... And she wasn't an angry drunk. She really wasn't. But, like, if she was going to get angry, it was going to be when she was drunk, if that makes sense. And never towards me. She never, like, none of the anger was ever towards me. But, like, with my dad. Um, but there was always just a sadness about, you know, her with them. And, you know, she would just say, like, you know, it just ended. It was, the, it was sad, Peter. She was like, we fell out of love with each other. And, um, you know... So I don't know where, like, the fear of, like, fighting and confrontation comes from. I really believe it comes from being bullied. I really think that's where it comes from. But, you know, it's interesting because, like, today, if I was the same person going back to middle school or high school, I, I would be confrontational. I talked about this on my vlog the other night. I would stand up for myself because I have nothing to lose. And, um, and I also know, like, I think there's an internal shame that comes from being bullied that whatever you're being bullied for, you know, um, whether it's being, you know, your sexuality or what people uh, assume your sexuality is or, you know, being too fat or being too thin. My friend Brittany used to be bullied horribly for being too thin. She, like, has talked a lot about that, you know. I mean, she's a you know, anti-bullying advocate and she's talked a lot about being bullied because people say, eat a cheeseburger or you're too thin. And, you know, we'll bully somebody for anything and it doesn't make it right. And uh, I think really that's where the fear of confrontation came from, that I, I always had this idea inside of me that if I just avoided it or took it long enough, that they'd eventually move on to somebody else, at least for a couple hours or a couple days or whatever, which typically was the case. The problem was it always came back to me. You know, it always came back on me again that I was, there I was, and I was the easy pick. So, you know, um... What was interesting about that at the time was, like, I always um, kind of defended the underdog in situations. You know, I would take up for the underdog, but I wouldn't necessarily take up for myself, if that makes sense. You know, like, somebody that had it worse than me, I would defend them, but then I wouldn't defend myself to these people. But I was really scared, too, you know, like... I mean, I was, like, physically threatened. I have talked about that I was sexually threatened. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that we don't talk about when we talk appropriately about bullying, and it can happen in groups of friends too, you know, I've talked to a lot of adult women who feel like they've been bullied in their own families or by friends to be a certain way or to do a certain thing or whatever, you know, and, um, 
I think there's a fear that goes in there and an internal shame, you know, that you buy into what that person's saying to some degree that like, well, I'm not good enough, you know? Um, even if what they're saying isn't true, I'm not good enough. I'm not worth fighting for. And I think that's where the, the hurt and the pain come from. And I think that it's easier to just avoid it and be like, oh yeah, we'll just go along with it instead of standing up for ourselves because we don't want to be all alone. I mean, that's the ultimate fear is having no one, right? So, you know, people use control and power to try to isolate other people. Um, After many, many years of working with this issue, I understand a lot about it, and there's a lot that goes into it. And one of the things that we really don't talk enough about is that the person that is the bully is typically in more pain, and I'm not making excuses for them, but they are typically more, obviously, why would I? But they're typically in more pain than the people they are bullying. And that's what they do with their pain. You know, it's very much like in Oprah, that episode, which is one of my favorite episodes ever, her aha moment, where she goes and visits the women in prison that killed their children, which is, you know, unforgivable. I mean, she says it in the video. She's like, they've done this thing that's like unforgivable. And at the end of it, one of the women says to them, why don't you hate us? <clears throat> and she says, hate you? No. See, because that's what you do with your pain and I do something different with mine. And, you know, I think that's important. You know, I think it's important to realize that we all of us have pain inside that we're trying to work out and we're trying to do something with. And awareness is the first part of that. You know, and I listen, I'm the first one to admit regularly that I am not perfect, that, you know, I'm a work in progress and that I try to remain teachable. And the reason why is I only want to get better. I only want to be a better version of myself one day to the next to the next to the next. I'm never going to be perfect. I understand that. And I'm going to foul up and I'm going to mess up and I'm going to have to own my truth and whatever. And it's not about like how I look to my friends or my family or to people that I know, like what they think about it. It's really how do I feel about myself inside, you know? Who am I when I'm all alone by myself? How do I feel about what I, my actions and who I am as a person? And you know, I think that's really what it's about at the end of the day. I've never once, after working with somebody that is a bully for a while, because, you know, I've, I've, had, I've even had the honor of sitting down and working things out with my own bully. And, you know, I talked about that the other day in my vlog and having coffee with him and really talking about things. And, you know, what I really found out was that he was in a lot of pain at that time that I was not aware of. And, you know, his way of getting through that was by being a court jester in school. But if you're going to be a court jester, you have to be making fun of somebody. Somebody else has to be the joke that you're picking on. And I happen to be that person. But his intention was never to hurt me. His intention was never to take me down. That was a symptom that he never thought of on the side. But the reality is that you don't realize that the person on the other end of that is a human being. And you have to think about that, you know, that when you're putting that person out and you're hurting them, that that person is a human being and they have feelings and emotions too, that you don't know how they're going to respond and how they're going to act about, you know? And, um, I don't know. I think it's an interesting concept. Um, I also think like... No, I just think that looking at themes in our lives help us learn who we are as people. Um, and writing this book for me has been just phenomenal to, for to like, oh my, be like, oh my God, like I never realized that before, you know? And, um, you know, just in looking at things that like I had done as traditions over and over and over again, like our Christmases, you know, or like spending Christmas with my aunt, my uncle and my cousin, which this was the first Christmas that I didn't do that. And, um, it really kind of like messed with me a little bit. And it was just because my, you know, my cousin was just, she was exhausted from having dealt with everything. And she's just like, you go do your thing this year. I'll go do my thing. And then next year we'll all do it together. And I was like, that's cool. You know, whatever. But like, 
we had been having Christmas together, with the exception of when my mom and I went to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, but even before that, we would go and have Christmas together, you know, for my entire life. And I had all these rituals and traditions that I did with my family and friends, and then slowly, one by one, everybody either left or died away, and, you know, I'm here, and all of a sudden, it's Peter's life, Peter all alone, and now I'm with Alex, who is a new person in my life in the last 10 years, and I've relearned new traditions and new rituals, like with his family, that is now my family, that is now my new rituals and traditions, but that's scary, you know? Because sometimes we wanna just stay in the same rituals and traditions forever. And what that says is that a lot of us are led by fear. I'm definitely led by fear at times. And so, then what's the issue I really need to work on? The issue I really need to work on is fear and removing fear from my life, so. Anyway, I'm gonna get off here and listen to my audiobook for a little bit. And, uh, yeah, and get some sleep tonight so I can hang out with my husband tomorrow afternoon. My husband. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a wonderful start to your week. I love you, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.